Okay, and uh, moving on to our last talk of the evening, um, I'd like to welcome virtually, although Jonathan will be back for uh, the questions at the end of his recorded talk, Dr. Jonathan Womack, who's a consultant anesthetist at the RVI in Newcastle, who has a specific interest in regional anesthesia and trauma uh, analgesia. He's also a council member of RA UK, and um, I've been really looking forward to this talk as certainly being um, leading a major trauma centre, this is one of the largest problems we have in terms of uh, managing our increasingly aging trauma population. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Jonathan says on the matter. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I suppose I've got uh, two declarations. One is that I've done some unpaid advisory work for Synthetica and the other is that um, I'm a paravertebral block enthusiast. So I'm slightly biased in this area. Uh, I do spend a reasonable amount of my time managing patients with rib fractures. So today we're going to ask essentially three simple questions. So the first question is why? Um, why even bother managing rib fracture pain in the first place? Or it's certainly why should we get involved as anaesthetists? And sometimes, you know, when we're busy um, with little time and recognition for, for doing this, um, it's easy to be to think why we bother. And certainly critics would suggest it's expensive, requires specialist skills outside the role of a traditional uh, anaesthetist. But I think certainly the, the positives massively overwhelm the benefits. Um, firstly, the, there are standards. So um, even the British Orthopaedic Association suggests that we should be putting blocks in the blunt wall chest trauma. So this is from their standards um, and agreed analgesia protocol, including neuroaxial, regional, including paravertebral and opioid, um, must be available for major trauma centres. Uh, there are also major trauma centre guidelines that suggest you should be offering patients with uh, rib fractures a block within a certain amount of time. There's some evidence of improved outcomes. So certainly the most compelling evidence exists for epidurals, which are the oldest regional anaesthetic technique for this. Um, so there is some evidence of better pain, better ventilatory parameters and reduced respiratory com uh, complications. There is some evidence for reduced pain as well with um, paravertebral or at least um, equivalent analgesia to uh, epidurals in selected patients. And also some, um, some evidence as well in erector spinae. And there is a hint of um, mortality benefit um, for both epidural and um, paravertebral. So people have been trying to prove for a long time that epidurals can improve patients with rib fracture. This is a, a multi-centre retrospective analysis from a few years ago um, that sh suggested a hint of it. And that was in concordance with, with our study that we published in anaesthesia a few years ago. Certainly not proven, but it's not disproven. Although, do we need to? Um, there is certainly a precedent for anaesthetists offering um, analgesic blocks um, with no um, outcome benefit whatsoever. Um, simply because they're good pain relief um, for patients with a risk of complications. So this is lumbar epidural. The final reason is professional satisfaction. So I find this really challenging, interesting, and it's also very rewarding when uh, you have a happy patient at the end of it. So who should do the block and who should receive a block? So there's two questions here. Who should do the block? Um, I think is reasonably easy to answer. So the first uh, thing to note is that there's various different models of, of, of this service delivery. So um, particularly for hip fracture, a, a large number of people have been described um, performing regional anesthesia. So this might be paramedics, um, nurse practitioners, orthopedic registrars, um, orthogeriatricians, uh, in, uh, ED. I've only really seen um, emergency department physicians um, and anaesthetists slash intensivists reported as performing blocks for rib fractures. Um, I think especially given that the pain from a rib fracture is going to last for a significant amount of time, I think that anaesthetists and and or intensivists are the only group that have the requisite skill set to put in a nerve catheter uh, and the time. And we've also got um, curriculums and governance frameworks to um, uh, 
uh, to support our practice. And also we have a, um, access to acute pain services. So I think really um, anaesthetists should be putting in blocks for patients with rib fractures. The next question of who gets a block is potentially quite challenging and one of the most difficult areas of this whole um, uh, clinical um, area. So we're going to make a decision based on the fact that the benefit is going to outweigh the risk. So the benefit is obviously pain relief um, and potentially improved outcomes. And the risk is going to be the risk of complication, but also, I suppose, risk of um, incurring uh, financial and time penalties that mean that care is, is taken away from somewhere that would benefit most from it. Uh, and also potentially some patients may want to go home, so we can't keep patients in hospital just to have a block. So there are a number of strategies to identify the patients at most risk of complications. So there are a number of factors that could determine this. We know that increasing age, particularly if you're over the age of 65, you have an increased risk of complications and death following rib fractures. There seems to be uh, a, a two points, whether you've got more than three or more than five rib fractures that also increase um, the risk. Particularly failed segments um, increase your um, risk of dying if you've got rib fractures and also concurrent respiratory disease. So we could decide to offer patients with these um, risk factors, paravertebral blocks, or sorry, regional anesthesia. Another way to do it would be to try and use a scoring system. So many of these scoring systems take into account um, the factors we just talked about. There's two um, that are uh, described that have a confusingly similar name. So we've got a rib score, and that's a radiographical assessment based on location, numbers, etc that can be given used to get to give a um, probability of uh, complication uh, or particularly pneumonia and then a rib fracture score which is uh, um, lo looks at the numbers and age uh, is another way of trying to identify those at risk of um, of dying at the rvi we use something called a PIC score which is a composite score that uses pain uh, inspiratory capacity and cough and that creates a, um, a score out of uh, 10. I think probably the most useful aspect of that is inspiratory capacity. Um, and there is some evidence that patients with a reduced inspiratory capacity, so less than 30% of normal or 15 mils per kilo um, of ideal body weight are at higher risk of complication. We don't have any proof that improving the inspiratory capacity from below that to above that with analgesia uh, makes a difference to the outcome, but um, maybe one day we will. And when we were looking at our study, um, we've also noticed the TARM PS17 was particularly effective at predicting the risk of mortality uh, in UK patients, um, or certainly our patients. Um, and that also takes into account other injuries as well. So not just uh, the chest, injury itself. Remember that having uh, rib fractures is a pretty significant injury and it doesn't usually happen in isolation, particularly if you've got lots of rib fractures. Um, and it may well be that the patients have got more chance of dying from other injuries than the rib fractures themselves. In my mind, the real benefit is people that are in severe pain and uh, because this is, an anal this is analgesia. So the um, what I would suggest is severe pain is pain that limits the ability to deep breathe and cough that's not controlled with oral analgesia and that's essentially the way that I that, that I assess these patients and if um, they haven't managed with that then um, we have a discussion and I off, we offer them a, a regional anaesthetic um, on the basis of that, and they can choose to uh, accept or uh, or to 
designed not, not to have a block. So this is from the Royal College of Anaesthetists uh, Consent Guidelines from 2017, I think, the most recent ones. And they suggest that all anaesthetists uh, should record the details of the discussion in the patient record, noting the risks, benefits and alternatives. So um, it's obviously a risk benefit analysis, but that also depends on what the alternatives are. So I think really there's three possible alternatives to um, a paravertebral block, sorry, a regional anaesthetic technique. Uh, the first is no treatment, um, which is entirely um, uh, reasonable. So, uh, well, um, it's certainly an option that uh, the patient may wish that actually they can manage to deal with the pain. Um, PCA is probably the main um, alternative. These go against enhanced recovery principles, in my opinion. They mean that patients um, are tied uh, to a drip stand, and also, uh, I, um, you know, we do know that opiates can be respiratory depressants, and I don't think that's a good combination with a patient that we want to encourage to cough, but they. And they are an option. And then fixation. So I don't think that fixation has ever been demonstrated to improve outcome simply as a um, for pain relief. And really it's patients that um, with flail and who have um, ventilatory issues due to that, that benefit from fixation. But certainly um, it may well be that an early fixation reduces the amount of pain down the line. The other thing with fixation is it doesn't necessarily preclude um, a regional anaesthetic technique. So which block? Um, well, uh, this was um, an editorial from a couple of years ago. Um, and certainly there's, there's very little evidence to choose. Um, and there are quite a few choices. So we'll go through a few of those. So the oldest is, of course, um, the epidural block. And this is from a textbook from 1946. Um, slightly unusual uh, looking setup, but still it's an epidural nonetheless. Um, there's certainly the most evidence for the use of epidural, but equally there's the most uh, evidence for complications. So we do know what the complications of a, an epidural are and they may or may not be worth the risk, uh, particularly in patients with um, coagulation problems. And they're also high maintenance, so we do know that a thoracic epidural is technically challenging, or can be technically challenging, and it needs to be looked after. Um, and certainly in my institution, many of the wards aren't happy to look after a patient with a thoracic epidural anymore. Finally, well, uh, we, we need to talk a little bit about anatomy, and this is the only bit of anatomy that we'll talk about. Um, the trunk is supplied by the spinal nerves. Um, they're segmental. Um, and they give off three branches. So the anterior branch supplies a, um, an area between the nipple, midclavicular line anteriorly and the um, center of the trunk. Um, the lateral branch supplies an area from the midclavicular line anteriorly to the midclavicular line posteriorly. And the posterior branch um, supplies uh, some skin overlying the middle of the back um, between the midclavicular line and the center of the back. So, the first option that's not an epidural is a paravertebral block. So that's in, um, injected into the little star-shaped area that I've marked on, the, on that anatomy. And this is roughly the sort of block that you get from a single, a single level paravertebral block. You can see that it won't necessarily call, cover all the rib fractures, uh, but it will cover a decent chunk of them. Um, I, I personally use ultrasound, so transverse oblique uh, picture and you get something like this ultrasound image on the on the right. Obviously it doesn't always look like this. This is a particularly slim uh, model who uh, would have volunteered to have their back scanned. Uh, but in a slim patient it is quite an inviting block. This is a couple of centimeters from the skin. It can be technically challenging though because you've got a narrow window with which to place your needle and if you stray off um, either side you start hitting rib. We're also into an area where 
there's blood vessels, and it's quite close to the pleura. The actual complications that are reported are generally pretty low, uh, surprisingly low, in fact, um, but uh, certainly it's in an area where you, you want to be careful. Because of that, there's been um, attempts to find fascial plane blocks of the chest that can perform like an epidural, um, but without the same technical difficulty and potential risk, uh, reduced risk of complication. So um, the, probably the most promising of these is the erector spinae block. So um, this injection is performed, as you can see where the, the green and blue stars are. And depending on which uh, study you read, it can produce a pattern, uh, a dermatomal coverage that looks something like um, the, either the green area or the blue area here. I think there's a bit of uncertainty about how this works. If, if, it, if the green area is to believe, it's probably through tracking through the um, serratus plane. So it's blocking the posterior and the uh, lateral branches, and it's probably working in rib fractures by um, covering the, periost the periosteum. If the blue area is to believe, it's probably by spreading through down to the paravertebral space. And in fact, it may be a combination of the two. Um, whatever, uh, how it, however it works, um, there is a suggestion here um, in this study that was published uh, in the same article of anesthesia as our um, root fracture analysis, that um, erect spinal block does improve um, respiratory and analgesic um, parameters in patients with rib fracture. And if you looked at the um, improvement in inspiratory capacity, it was actually very similar to what I would expect from a, from a paravertebral block. So there is some evidence uh, of, of its analgesic effect in rib fractures. And this is just to show that even in the original um, depiction and in a recent study in Rapham, that parasternal um, sparing is often noted, which does lead me to think that maybe this is via underneath the serratus plane uh, towards the lateral branches. The image is pretty similar to, well, it's identical to a sagittal paramedian paravertebral block. Um, and it's, this is technically easier because you've got a, a wider um, area to aim at. It doesn't really matter if you're injecting in the erector spinae plane um, at the level of the transverse process or slightly wider on a rib or even on the, um, la the lamina, it would still have a similar, very similar spread and effect. A third option is the serratus plane block. So this is going to um, uh, correspond to the area on the on the trunk uh, that's represented by the dark blue. And you can perform a very similar um, block um, to block the anterior branches, um, which is going to uh, correspond to the area on the under, which is light blue. Um, so note where the ultrasound is for the paravert for the uh, serratus plane. So in the in the sort of um, mid, -clavic mid clavicular line, and you can inject either above or below the serratus muscle, which is the muscle that's seen on this image just above the rib. So that really brings back to therapeutic benefit and risk. So certainly, um, the the choice. Um, isn't straightforward. It depends on your skill set. So I would always probably put in a paravertebral block on the basis that if I'm trying to provide good pain relief, that I'll get the most pain relief or from the one from the block that's it's understood how it works. Um, but clearly there are risks associated with that, um, and particularly if you if you're more comfortable with doing a serratus plane or an ESP, the risk will be lower, uh, and you may still get some. Um, some therapeutic, we will still get some therapeutic benefit. It's also worth remembering that the pain was going to last for days, so you need to put a catheter in and you need to follow up the patients and a, you need an acute pain service. So my final thoughts are that um, region anesthesia is the best that we can offer for patients with rib fracture. Um, it's challenging and we really don't know so, so much about uh, this, so we haven't talked about what drugs to pick, um, what infusion rates to pick, um, timing of the block. There really are a lot of unanswered questions, even just beyond which block to pick. Um, the service that, that I offer is probably very different to what um, others offer. Uh, and I think that really depends on the local setup and your skill set. And 
finally, just to highlight that it's this year in the 5th or 7th of May, or next year, sorry, in Edinburgh is the RA UK and International Society for Upstand Guided Regional Anesthesia joint meeting. And this is really surely no better place to learn about rib fracture analgesia than that. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. That was a fantastic talk. And thanks so much for hanging around at work super late in order to be able to take the questions live. It was, it was much appreciated. I'm, I'm just going to add in a, a little um, a little anaesthesia advert to keep my boss Andy Klein happy for your excellent paper that we published in anaesthesia in 2019 that runs through uh, how effective the services that you've set up at um, uh, RBI and certainly if there's anyone not sure whether they should do it, the data you presented in that makes a pretty compelling uh, case for running these as a routine part of your trauma service. Um, a few questions, um, one that comes around a lot is um, uh, threshold cutoffs for INR, antiplatelet agents, DOAX, um, reversibility of these, do you use a TEG to guide when they can be done? Um, how do you, how do you uh, pick apart this conundrum? Um, so, uh, so we, in summary, what I do is I chat to the patient about it. I think it depends on, it depends on how, how how quick it will take to reverse it, um, how much pain they're in. Um, I think per se, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't avoid, I mean, paravertebral blocks, the, the, the risk of hematoma, I mean, it's described in the literature, but there is literally no, um, ne but never from a, a non-surgically placed one. So it's, you know, it's theoretical, I think, at this stage. So it's very difficult to say with any certainty. Um, and if the patient's really in pain and about to go on to a ventilator, then I would offer them it regardless or make a best interest decision. Um, if they're not in that much pain, then I would have a serious conversation about it and decide whether they really wanted it or not. And we could we could wait to try and reverse it. I think, you know, they're much more likely to come from harm from bleeding from their ribs or hemoth uh, hemothorax than they are from me putting a, a needle under direct vision. So I think it's, I, I don't, I'm, I'm guided by clinical scenario and risk benefit rather than any clear cutoff. Um, and before erector spinae and serratus, we had no option other than a thoracic epidural or a paravertebral. So we would do a paravertebral for the low risk ones and they were, you know, we have had problems. Uh, and in terms of selecting out your patients, do, do your, you mentioned that the PICS score, which is nice because it's much simpler. Some of the other rib fracture scores are ferociously complicated in trying to score. Do, they, do you screen all your patients using that and then pick up those? Uh, that we flag? We've never found it. So there's no, there's no evidence to suggest that you should. Uh, so, so some people have used it to try and guide PCA or block. Um, we've tended to use it as a as a measure of effectiveness and de deteriorating patient and something that's reassuring if we think we don't actually need to you know if the patient doesn't want to do, have a block and they've got a vital capacity of two and a half thousand then that's reassuring so i think you know um and it aids the discussion with the patient about what we're aiming to achieve whether we're aiming to achieve decent you know a good tidal volume or analgesia or you know um uh, it's part of the decision making tool but we don't use it um strictly and i think really it really does come down to whether the patient wants to have an injection in the back for the pain relief and they're they're prepared to accept the risks and it's remarkable how many patients just say i don't care about the risks i just want the thing that um that causes pain relief now whether that's a fair you know whether that's a, a you know a decision they regret i don't know but very few patients turn it down and, and on practical terms in terms of running this service how many of them are you? I mean, what sort of what sort of level of skill do departments need to have in terms of uh, people doing it? Um, is it yeah. something that everyone can be trained to do relatively quickly, or do or how big a pool do you need of available people? Yeah, you need a bit. You need a decent pool. And it was um, so when we started, there was probably three or four consultants that did it, and that was really stressful because there would only be there would only be you around, and you'd know that at the end of your list. There was a patient on ITU that wanted a paravertebral. We, we are quite lucky because we've got very proactive breast surgeons who want every patient uh, to have a paravertebral block. So we have a natural training facility for paravertebrals. And we've got, so we've probably got 10 to 15 consultants 
that can put paravertebral catheters in and at any time there's a there's a steady stream of um, registrars so one of the things they want to learn how to do is put paravertebrals in so the keen ones pick it up very quickly um, uh, so yeah so I think you need you need, and, and we have you know 300 plus rib fractures a year so uh, there is a steady you know what every you know there'll be a few a week so there is a there's a steady trickle um, and regular paravertebrals. So I think that's the key is, is, you know, if it's done regularly, there'll be plenty of people that can do it. And and if we're starting, which which one do you think people should start with? Because we've got, yeah. it's like it's like Rosie meant to, we've got, you know, paravertebral, ESB, MTP. Um, it's, a bit, it's, it's a bit like the hip fracture, isn't it? You've got a, a thousand different options and it's difficult to know where to start. I think the most obvious one to start with is ESP. I think that is, uh, I think, of all of them so serratus plane has been around longer and they've only, i was going to say there's no that there's no evidence really that for its use in rib fractures but actually within the last uh, few months there's been a randomized controlled trial uh, i was going to i had the I'll, I'll maybe tweet the um the, the study because i was going to mention it and i left the note at home but uh, I, I forgot in the so there is so the, but that's small you know there's 13 either arm reduction in uh, tramadol PCA use but you know not massively significant clinically although statistically significant um, so I think erector spinae is the most uh, uh, is the most useful in terms of there is reasonable evidence that it works other it seems to be enthusiastic so people have adopted it it's it's probably easier to learn than a paravertebral and it, it's not far from doing an erector spinae to doing a paravertebral block so, uh, once you can do an erector spina, you've probably got the skill set to do a paravertebral. You just don't know it yet. And uh, just a final question on practicality: people want to know is, um, are these done mainly on um, medical patients who go in, or is this an ITU service? Are the medical wards happy to take patients with catheters and other bits and pieces yeah. in them? So, so this is another thing about our setup. So we all of our rib fracture patients are admitted under A and E on the trauma ward so they are um, or HDU so that's the only places that we look after them we occasionally pick up um, rib fractures on a on a and they and ortho jerry's are on the ED ward on the trauma ED ward as well so um, so we occasionally pick up patients that are on the respiratory ward or care of the elderly ward that have been missed but then they get transferred to the uh, trauma ward so the trauma ward is used to looking after patients with a paravertebral or they're on HDU so that is a, is another thing you know we've we, we have the luxury of a pain service award that's used to it uh, all in one place great that's fantastic and uh, 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 one final question are you, are you running infusions or intermittent boluses down catheters uh, is it just a bomb situation or just intermittent boluses so I'm so this is uh, um, I'm really keen to try intermittent boluses uh, it, we, this can be feedback again I've I've never we use elastomeric pumps on the for the uh, portability for anyone that can mobilize and I think that's important because it means that they get out of bed they can deep you know um, I've not we've we've tried the ambit pumps and our nurses don't really don't like them to program them and they tried to and the board kept on trying to throw them in the bin because they thought they were disposable but they're not uh, and uh, the, the problem is that we I know that other places have used them really successfully, but that's when they don't want to alter the program. I think they're, they're a bit less programmable um, for what we wanted. Um, and we're trying to find a portable programmable pump that can do programmed intermittent bolus that's portable. I, mean, um, I think that's probably the way forward. There's very little evidence, but it works in epidurals for labor. And I think um, you get the occasional patient who they're okay, but they need a top up every now and then. Um, you know the infusion the the bolus is better than the infusion so i think intermittent bolus is the way forward but we haven't got a good way of delivering it so we do infusion fantastic that's great thank you so much for staying so late at work in answering the questions for an outstanding talk <laughs> thanks gentlemen thank you very much. no worries